a Faith and Faith podcast, 053, The Great Commission, go. Well, welcome to my five-part series about the Great Commission, and welcome to A Faith That Obeys, where we're rethinking the traditional plan of salvation. <laughs> Why are we rethinking something that everyone thought was settled? Well, this traditional plan, which I also call the modern plan, is a fairly new invention and has tragically replaced the biblical plan of salvation. When we study the Bible and see how people were born again in the first century, then compare that with how people become Christians today, there are some stark differences. Things have changed. Our goal is to identify the biblical steps to salvation, then support you in your efforts to learn what the Lord desires in order to correctly follow his plan so that you may have full assurance that you're walking on the correct path. Now, where do we get this idea that there is a biblical plan of salvation? Well, the plan is presented by Jesus and it's called the Great Commission. So let's take a deep dive into the commission and find out how it lays out the biblical plan of salvation. Now, I suspect you're about to hear some things that you have never heard before, and it may come as a little shock. So let's go. When we read the Great Commission, we see four crisp commands. Now, these commands provide the final marching orders for the 11 apostles given by Jesus at the time of his ascension into heaven over 2,000 years ago. For me, these commands are clear, unambiguous, simple, yet potent, and they embody the culmination of Jesus' entire earthly ministry and are designed to launch and propel a movement destined to last for generations to come. Let's read this amazing mandate. It's found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. For many Christians, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. It's held in high regard and often enthusiastically preached from the pulpit. But are we really following these commands? Are we really obeying everything Jesus asked us to do? Here are these commands presented as a list. Number one, go. Number two, make disciples. Number three, baptize them. And four, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Let's look carefully at each of these directives. In this lesson, we'll tackle this first command, which is go. As we begin, I think there are a few issues worthy of discussion, so we're all on the same page. First, are these actually four commands? Why not call them suggestions? Should we really take Jesus' final words with such terminal seriousness that they should be called commands? Second, what happens if I refuse to obey these commands? Is it serious? Third, there's a promise at the end of the Great Commission. Jesus promises to be with us always until the very end of the age. Do I receive that promise if I'm unwilling to follow his instruction? Fourth, must I obey all four commands? Do I have to go? Do I have to make disciples? Do I have to baptize them? Do I have to teach them to obey everything? Are all of these things required for every person who calls themselves a disciple? And by the way, what's a disciple anyway? Wasn't a disciple one of those 12 guys Jesus called into his inner circle? These are super important questions, and we'll deal with them in our next few lessons about the Great Commission. Now, I think the Great Commission contains four commands, not four suggestions, not, not four ideals. I think Jesus was pretty clear. Since they are commands, they're not optional on our part. A command is a command and therefore must be obeyed. We have no choice in the matter if we want to participate in what we might metaphorically call the program. These commands are designed to support the program. If we're going to be full members, so to speak, of the program, we must follow the master's rules. That makes sense, right? If we do not follow the rules, we are only outsiders. We are observers, not members. We can hang out around the program. We can observe the program from a distance. We might evaluate the program, maybe even for a very long time. We can even enthusiastically endorse and support the program 
with our time and our money. But if we want to be a full part of the program, we will need to accept the unconditional requirements for membership. We need to join the program, right? Members receive the benefits associated with the program. Non-members do not receive those exclusive and wonderful benefits, no matter how much we contribute to the program. We're either members or not members. This isn't complicated. Jesus commanded us to do something. If we want to be part of his mission, we must follow his instructions. And it's not hard because those who want to be part of his program foster a deep love and adoration for the program manager. This emotional bond exceeds any type of purely human devotion imaginable. You know, disciples of Jesus don't feel like we have to do anything. We, we feel like we get to do the things Jesus asks us to do. Now, I'll bet you never considered the Great Commission as a framework for God's plan of salvation. But if we break everything down, as we're about to do in this brief series of lessons, and ask some super critical questions, we're going to discover a roadmap that absolutely leads to that conclusion. So, what about this first command to go? When we consider this first command, we see it is direct and straightforward. The disciples were to get out of Jerusalem to, to, to proactively move into the rest of the world. Go means don't stay here. It's the beginning of the mission, the beginning of the church era, the beginning of a movement still active today. But why should they go? Just a simple act of leaving Jerusalem would be worthless without the next command, the impetus of the going. The next command is make disciples. When the disciples got up and went, they took the message about the kingdom of God to the entire world and in the hopes that some people might join them. This became their mission. This is the reason they should go. So the purpose of the Great Commission was to ensure that the gospel would advance after Jesus' earthly ministry was complete. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but the cool part of the Great Commission is Jesus' fourth command. He told the disciples to teach everyone they met everything he taught them, which includes the commands of all the Great Commission. The whole thing becomes self-propelling. It's very clever. Jesus' plan is for one man to teach another man everything, just as he taught his disciples. Every disciple of Christ treasures and holds as paramount these same four basic commands. Disciples pass them on to the people they meet and teach. Now, while the word go is a very small word, it contains a powerful activity called evangelism. Evangelism is the deliberate effort to introduce people to the master and his redemptive plan. Evangelism is a form of zealous advocacy for a program or a cause. There'd be no point in going if we did not carry a vital message to present as we go. If you've been listening to our podcasts here at A Faith That Obeys, you'll know that we believe baptism, the third command of the Great Commission, is a requirement for membership in Jesus' program. The Great Commission charges me quite explicitly with baptizing the people I meet who want to become disciples. I do not have a choice in this matter. I must obey the command to baptize people, or I am not obeying the Lord's directions. What possible reason could I have for deviating from this ancient and, dare I say, divine plan? I don't think I'm going to mess with that one. Now, likewise, if I want to be made a disciple and am unwilling to obey this command, I reject the entire plan Jesus has laid out for me. I must obey the command to be baptized before I can attain membership in the program. I don't get baptized after I'm a member. My obedience and baptism is how I sign the contract, so to speak. It's my pledge of a clear conscience and a solemn obligation that I will obey the master to the best of my ability. Now, just like my baptizer, I don't have the right to make even minor changes to Jesus' instructions, even if my intentions are good. I think this is important to say clearly because there's a lot of confusion about baptism in the modern church era. Some people claim baptism is a work and therefore not necessary for membership. I argue that baptism can't be a work because it's a command of Christ, and those two concepts are mutually exclusive. If baptism is a command, I have no choice but to obey it if I want to be a member. And we'll talk more about baptism later in this series. Now, here's the kicker. Knowing the seriousness and sanctity of this command to baptize, I must conclude that evangelism 
is just as much a command as baptism, and as such, is also a requirement for membership. If I'm unwilling to obey the Master to evangelize people as I go, I cannot be a part of his program called the Kingdom of God. Guys, this is huge. Can it be? I'm not in a right relationship with God if I'm not evangelistic? Wow. Let's talk about evangelism. What is evangelism? Well, as I've already stated, evangelism is the deliberate effort to introduce people to Jesus Christ. It's part of what being a disciple is all about. A disciple makes disciples. In fact, there's no other kind of disciple. Jesus established that fact way back in the beginning of his ministry. Look how this idea played out back in Mark. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. These men knew the purpose of their lives was about to change. Their lives would no longer be spent catching fish. They were called to a higher purpose. They would be catching people for Christ. Now take special note of the time frame. Those Jesus followers knew right from the outset they would have a mission that involved outreach. This is not what is happening in our churches today. Not at all. Today, people are told to come follow Christ for a better life, a better marriage, greater wealth, to clean up their lives, any other variety of reasons. Certainly not in a million years to fish for men. Don't you think that a proper introduction to Jesus should include a bit of information about how the kingdom of God operates? I mean, after a person believes and wants to commit to Christ? But why is this not happening? Well, because if you told someone thinking about joining your church that their job would be fishing for men, it would probably scare most people off. Evangelism can be a terrifying proposition. The thought of inviting a friend or a complete stranger to learn about Jesus, study the Bible, or come to church can be intimidating. But when we have a deep, rich, real relationship with God, when, when we're doing well spiritually, it's nearly impossible to keep our mouths shut. We want to tell everyone the good news. Luke 6.45 The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Listen, we all talk about the things we love. It might be sports or video games, a hobby, or our job. For the disciple, we can't stop talking about Jesus. Frankly, this is what sometimes makes us come across a little bit obnoxious to our non-Christian friends, and, and even to some folks who call themselves Christians but don't practice their faith. We can't shut up. Out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth speak, our, our spiritual desire becomes our natural desire, an overwhelming desire, and then the next thing you know, we wind up creating YouTube videos. So while an unenlightened newcomer to your church would naturally balk at the notion of evangelism as a requirement, no truly converted soul feels the burden to be evangelistic. There's an honor and a, and a pleasure which accompanies the effort. We even invent opportunities to preach. And when we receive a positive response to our preaching, all heaven breaks loose. An open door means we get to talk and talk and talk about our love for the Lord and His Word. Now this spiritual effect about the overflow of the heart gushing from the mouth can really get some young Christians into trouble because they've not learned the grace and the tact which should accompany their testimony. But you know what? God's in control and their boldness is often blessed accordingly. Now I get it. Some people have that natural gift of gab and enjoy speaking to people and have absolutely no difficulty starting a conversation. Other people do not. For them, to learn that evangelism is a command might feel distressing. But you know what? I think God has made provisions for both character types. Check this out. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5 through 7. What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. The Lord has assigned each to his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. 
In this passage, Paul talks about his and Apollos' evangelistic efforts. Paul was the initial planter of the gospel seed. Apollos, a great orator himself, came along afterward and watered what Paul had planted. It was a team effort. Important to understand in the process is that neither Paul nor Apollos is in any way responsible for how, when, or even if the seed will grow. Only God makes that happen. It's up to him. Their job was planting and or watering. My feeling is that each of us should have a personal ministry, a personal outreach, a, a focused effort on advancing the mission of Christ. So, while you might not be the type of person who can easily invite someone to church, your role might be to bake the cookies for the Bible study group, or maybe you'll be the person who listens intently to a friend's story and can help them through some difficult issues by pointing them to an encouraging passage in the Bible. Perhaps you might help with car repair or transportation when a friend is in need. Sometimes it's the smallest act of kindness which softens a person's heart and makes them ask, why are you doing this? This reminds me of a famous saying about personal evangelism, often attributed to St. Francis. He said, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. This certainly expresses how a true disciple of Jesus should live their life with the goal of evangelism in mind. Francis probably got this idea from Jesus. Look what Jesus said in Matthew, Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now listen carefully, this is super important. How we live has as much impact as what we say. Our words are powerful, but our lives must also shine brightly and attract people to Christ. One of the greatest problems in modern day Christianity comes from people who claim the name of Christ, but live hypocritical lives. This brings shame and derision on the Lord. Our lives must be in sync with our message. Let's not claim Christ if our lives do not live up to that claim. Now here's something very interesting. Have you ever noticed that evangelism tends to be an excellent barometer indicating how well a person is doing spiritually? Let me explain. When a person becomes a Christian, God indwells them with his Holy Spirit, right? As a result, a person gains new perspectives on life. They, they have a confidence and a, a peace of mind which was not present before. They now possess what the scriptures call the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22-23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When a person is truly born again, all of these things are new and amazing. As joy and peace initially fill their heart, they're naturally compelled to talk about it. Over time, these feelings tend to fade if our relationship with God is not cared for and nourished. All relationships, whether earthly or divine, need attention. Two important disciplines are active in every healthy relationship. Time together and communication. A real, vital, lively relationship with God is no different than our human relationships. It requires both time together and communication. Our cherished spiritual blessings of joy, peace, and the others can fade when we neglect our walk with God. For this reason, a spiritual person reads their Bible and prays every day. This is how we create time together and communication. We're constantly in the process of deliberately pursuing a deeper relationship with God. We fan into flames those God-given gifts. But when this is not happening, when someone is not doing well spiritually, one of the first casualties of the battle is personal evangelism, our, our personal outreach. We stop talking about the Master, and we stop talking about the Word of God. Eventually, we don't even want to be part of the fellowship, and next, we fall away from the Lord and leave the church. This is why I believe personal outreach is a pretty good indicator of how a person is doing spiritually. It's the first thing to suffer when our minds are not firmly set on heavenly things. When our love grows cold, our mouths stop speaking. Now I understand, some people are on fire for the Lord, and some people just barely make it through the day even thinking about God. The good news is, this is a manageable condition. It's improved by our commitment to a deeper relationship with God by spending time in Bible study and prayer. Once again, time together and communication. Fighting the fight to fan the flames is vital if we want to be our best for God 
and strive to obey his commands. Now, maybe you're a person who waters, a person who's deeply devoted to serving others as your main form of outreach. Maybe you're not comfortable speaking to strangers, but you are super active in serving others. You know, good works done for Christ. When was the last time you explained why you do what you do to the beneficiaries of your kind service? Do people think you serve them and care for them just because you're a really nice person? Or do they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that all of the wonderful things you do for them is only possible because you have a deep love and desire to serve God? Folks, how can we be a disciple of Jesus if we are unwilling to obey his commands, including the command to go? Just like baptism, it is an act of faith, not human work. Evangelism is an act of faith and springs out of an inward desire. This command is part of the Great Commission and designed to grow the Lord's church. If you don't think personal evangelism is a problem in the modern church, when was the last time you heard a preacher speak directly and frankly about our responsibility for it in any great detail? It's honestly pretty sad. Evangelism in the modern church is mostly dead. Now this begs the question, how could a church leadership change this condition and become lightning focused on the command to go and bring the members along enthusiastically with their convictions? The way to fix this is for church leadership to develop methods and help members develop those same convictions, then stick to the mission of seeking and saving the lost. Critical to this plan is to communicate the fact that personal evangelism is essential and this message is clearly preached from the pulpit and in small groups and our efforts are evaluated. Yeah, we ask that question. How is it going in your personal ministry? Surprisingly, members who understand the mission welcome this sort of challenge. We're not offended or feel like we're on some sort of pot seat. We want to be our best for Christ and we want to be effective in our outreach, so we're always willing to do anything which could help us on our quest. And you know what? When these things happen, the church grows by leaps and bounds. Why? Well, because everyone is involved in a common mission. We're one in spirit and purpose. We all understand these are Jesus' wishes from the Great Commission and we're actually fulfilling his dream. Folks, there is a powerful effect at work when this happens. Think about it. You may be in what we might call a dry spell regarding the people who are responding to your invitation. But one of your brothers or sisters might need help with someone that they've just met. So you jump in and support them in their watering efforts and things become amazing as you watch another hard heart soften and make the decision to obey the gospel. Listen carefully. There is absolutely nothing that can fire you up spiritually than studying the Bible with someone who is open. Just imagine, if that can happen to you, it could happen to an entire church. But now be careful. Just because you're evangelistic or have a powerful personal outreach to the needy does not prove anything. Faith without action is dead, right? But action without faith does not make you alive. It's just empty religion. We don't obey the command to evangelize just so we can check a box off on the duty roster. We obey the command because we are in love with the master. Without evangelism, a church will die. And if your church is not growing, what's going on in the evangelism department? And by the way, have you noticed that evangelism has been taken over by the marketing department of the church? I'm not sure that's how the Lord wants it. Marketing departments and outreach programs are fine and dandy, but nothing will ever replace or be more effective than one person sharing their life and testimony with another person for the purpose of changing them for all eternity. When we stop and carefully consider evangelism as an act of faith, it gets personal. What's going on with my personal evangelism? This is an important question to ask ourselves because as the individual goes, so goes the church. If an individual is not focused on actively seeking and saving the lost, the church will not grow. No member is exempt from this activity, and a church that wants to grow should have just a modicum of accountability for personal evangelism. So how does accountability in a voluntary program work? 
Well, in an effort to develop accountability, we need to assume that a member is willing to gladly submit to Jesus' command to go. When a group of people are dedicated to this mission and want to press forward, they build a list of people that they're reaching out to. Lists? Well, sure. There's got to be some sort of organization, right? But what are these lists? There's nothing really weird or legalistic here. These are prayer lists. When we get together in our small group meeting, we ask, who are you reaching out to? Is there anything we can do to help you? That person and their needs are added to the list so members of the group will keep them in prayer throughout the week. I hope you can imagine how bonding and exciting this can be as the entire small group watches people that they have personally met see great victories over difficult situations and even come to Christ. We see answers to prayers exactly for what they've been praying for. This is how accountability is created and maintained and everyone gets pretty excited about it. At the end of our small group meeting, we always go through our prayer list and pray out loud for everyone on it. So, how are you doing spiritually? When was the last time you introduced someone to Jesus? When was the last time you baptized a person or even opened the Bible with a non-Christian? When was the last time you invited someone to learn about Christ? If our own personal outreach is not frequently in the forefront of our mind, we may be missing something. Challenging, isn't it? Well, all this from that little word go, the first command of the Great Commission. It's pretty potent. It carries a lot of weight. It tests our character. It has the power to change the world. But isn't that exactly what Jesus wanted as he delivered these mandates to his men? Sure, these things are not easy, and Jesus never promised us it would be. He simply promised that he would be with us always until the very end of the age. And of course, his promise is only reserved for the members of his program, the people who have a sincere desire to please the master. Christ's promise is only for those who have a faith that obeys. Well, thanks for listening and watching. Join the argument at www.faiththatobeys.org slash blog.